Welcome to the National Medical Association Professional Development Series in collaboration with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. Our moderator today is our esteemed colleague, Dr. Patricia Whitney Williams. She is a professor of pediatrics, chief of the Division of Pediatric Allergy, Immunology, and Infectious Diseases, and Associate Dean for Inclusion and Diversity at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Welcome, Dr. Patricia Whitley Williams. Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. McDougall, for that kind introduction. We are very excited about our ses session today. Uh, in talking about what does the Black community need to know about vaccinations during the COVID-19 pandemic. This session will discuss the accessibility and safety uh, of vaccines for both adult and pediatric populations, including those in development for COVID-19. This session will also explore how the accessibility and availability of vaccines can impact health disparities faced by underserved communities, most notably low-income communities, rural communities, and communities of color. Finally, this session will attempt to address some of the most common misconceptions and conspiracy theories associated with vaccines and with COVID-19 therapies. So let's get started. We have a wonderful panel uh, very experienced uh, and experts um, in these matters. I'm delighted to introduce our first uh, speaker, Dr. Sonia S. Hutchins. She is Director of the Public Health and General Preventive Medicine Residency Program at Morehouse School of Medicine. She is a professor in the Department of Community Health and preventive medicine. Dr. Hutchins will describe the importance of vaccine safety and types of vaccine monitoring systems in place in the US. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Hutchins. Thank you. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here this morning and would like to thank the National Medical Association and the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for the foresight in holding such a panel to discuss what the Black community needs to know about vaccinations during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we prepare for the licensing of a vaccine against COVID-19, it is important that the community receive flu vaccine during the flu season as early as September. In addition, given that our community is at increased risk for exposure, serious illness, uh, leading to hospitalization, and unfortunately, death due to COVID-19, compared with other communities, we should also promote the COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available. But we do recognize that there's a lot of skepticism in our community about the COVID-19 vaccine and other vaccines, which is understandable given that a number of our uh, community members still remember the Tuskegee syphilis study and other studies in which uh, African Americans were um, mistreated. And this is a long time mistrust against the government. So we have to be mindful of the skepticism and understand that it comes from a real place. And we have to be very sensitive when we communicate about the benefits of COVID-19 uh, vaccine for our community and to address the issues related with safety. I want to, to also say that um, even though we um, feel this way, there was a recent poll uh, done by the media that showed that 20% of Black or African Americans plan to take the COVID-19 vaccine when it becomes available, compared with 56% whites 
and 37% Hispanics. And that 32% of us are not sure, and 40% said that they would not take the vaccine at all. So we have to begin the dialogue with the Black community uh, by educating about vaccine safety and what steps are taken by the federal government to ensure that vaccines are safe. Uh, before I go into that, I wanted to uh, indicate that I don't have any disclosures, any financial gains or conflicts of interest. Next slide. As uh, Dr. Whitley Williams indicated, that I will be focusing on the importance of vaccine safety and the types of safety monitoring activities. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. The basic principle of vaccination is that you give a, let's say a virus or a part of a vaccine um, or a part of the organism that the vaccine is made from. And you give that weakened form or a part of the uh, organism. And the principle is that it doesn't cause any symptoms or illness, but it may cause some side effects, but the side effects tend to be very minor. So we have to be very clear of what we're doing when we communicate with the our, uh, members of our community and to let them know that there's an interest in giving a safe vaccine to healthy people. So that means that there are very low risks um, for uh, any adverse or harmful effects from vaccine because we are giving it to healthy people. Even though um, this is the case, this is the case more so than with medications in which you give someone who might be ill a medication or a drug and, and you weigh the benefits and risks of giving that. But with vaccines, you're giving it to healthy people. So you have to be very, very careful. And because um, vaccines uh, and the government has a less of a tolerance of vaccine risk, that the manufacturers must carefully examine the safety of the vaccines from the development of the candidate vaccine to licensure and then after licensure of the vaccine. And this is done through the regulation by the federal government through the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, next slide, please. How does the government regulate then uh, vaccine development and vaccine licensure and then post-licensure monitoring? How it does this is by carefully conducting laboratory studies to find out how a piece of the, uh, a virus or the organism may work in humans. So what they do are laboratory studies to identify, is it the protein um, outer coat of the virus, for example, that causes um, our immune system to be stimulated? Or is it another part? Or do you need the whole virus? So these laboratory studies go on first. And then after the laboratory studies where you identify uh, uh, the whole virus or a piece of the virus as a potential candidate for a vaccine, that is actually given to animals. And then in animals, they determine whether it's safe and whether the animal even stimulates an immune response. Now, before, before uh, these uh, candidate vaccines are actually tested in humans, you have to apply to the, the uh, Food and Drug Administration and demonstrate that the vaccine or the candidate vaccine, in fact, is, um, is safe and pure and potent. And, you, and they also have to disclose what is in that particular uh, candidate vaccine before human studies are even embarked on. So let's go to uh, the next slide. So once the Food and Drug Administration gets approval for testing in humans, there are three phases of these studies. The first phase is a small study with about 20 to 100 people. 
who have volunteered to receive that candidate vaccine. And then uh, the, the sponsor looks at the safety profile of that candidate vaccine in the human volunteers. Then the next phase is a little larger in which you have hundreds of volunteer volunteers. And at that time, you look at safety, but you also, in general, look at how well the immune response is to this candidate vaccine. And then after that, the third phase is, is typically, you know, in the community, you get the vaccine and then you test it in thousands of volunteers. And you see whether the volunteers who either get the vaccine or who get what they call a placebo and they are a control group, whether those who got the vaccine are, are stimulating an immune response that protects you from the vaccine, uh, not from the vaccine, but from the wild um, virus, let's say, in the community. And then you also, at that point, look at safety as well. And you look at really rare events. So if you have tens and thousands of people, you can look at very rare uh, side effects from a vaccine. And all those phases of trials have to be conducted in humans before it's licensed for widespread use um, through the Food and Drug Administration. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. Now, it doesn't stop there after the vaccine is licensed, again, because there may be some really rare events. So we're talking about more than one event after, uh, uh, you know, in a population of 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000. So you have to continue to monitor the safety of vaccine once it's licensed. And these are the, the main reasons why, because we wanna identify rare reactions, even in millions of people. And to monitor increases in the known reactions and to see you know, really uh, how frequent they are. And when we talk about reactions, we're really talking about the minor reactions that if you get an injected, an, 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 injectable vaccine, it would be at the location of that injection. You're gonna have an inflammatory response or, uh, or some immune response. So you might see a little um, swelling, some redness, and uh, you might have some pain uh, at the injection site. And that's really what is uh, typically accepted uh, from a vaccine before it's licensed. Okay, so in, in addition to monitoring any reactions to vaccines, after the vaccine is licensed, there are activities to also identify if there are any vaccine lots with any increased rates of reactions to vaccines. And then um, there is more monitoring to see if there are any harmful effects that are more numerous than would be expected. So this is how vaccines are carefully uh, monitored after uh, licensure. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so what is the federal government doing specifically uh, to monitor vaccine safety after licensure? Let's go to the next slide. There is uh, this vaccine adverse event reporting system that is administered by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Food and Drug Administration. And it's a national reporting system in which everyone is expected to report. If there's any concern that there is a, um, a reaction after vaccination, healthcare providers, manufacturers, or even the public should report to this vaccine adverse event reporting system. Uh, on average, there are about 30,000 reports per year, but these reports, I know it seems like a lot, but if, if you look at uh, that uh, 160 to 300 million doses of vaccines are given annually, um, there may be like one report per 10,000 um, population. 
And again, it depends on healthcare providers, manufacturers, and the public reporting to it. If you know about a vaccine reaction, um, you can report it to uh, the VARA system and the actual website is here at the bottom of the screen. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so there are several additional vaccine safety activities after li a vaccine licensure that are, go on. There are what they call phase four trials, where they also have uh, tens and thousands of participants um, that is specific to certain questions that need to be answered. Um, and it may include certain uh, population groups, certain age groups, those with uh, certain conditions. And they are uh, trials that are asked uh, by the FDA to be conducted to answer a number of these uh, questions. As it relates to the vaccine data link, this is a very important system for reporting um, adverse events and monitoring those events in that they use uh, healthcare records and they link them to the pharmacy records and to determine if there's reactions that are actually caused by the vaccine in millions of people. Uh, and so this is a very important uh, database and uh, system that monitors uh, adverse reactions. Then the last system that the federal government has is uh, the Clinical Immunization Safety Assessment Project. And it looks more carefully at any reactions that are um, clinically significant at the individual level so that it helps healthcare providers treat people uh, effectively uh, for those reactions. So let's go to the next slide. Now, um, despite all of those activities that the federal government is involved in, uh, in 1986, there was established a vaccine injury compensation program uh, for uh, routine vaccines. And it's a no-fault system. So if uh, there is concern that a individual was uh, actually harmed by vaccine and uh, it is biologically plausible and it's been documented as a reaction after vaccination, then you can apply to this compensation program um, and it's a no fault program. And there's a list of conditions in which are um, compensated. And, and, it, and at the bottom of the slide, you see the vaccine injury table. You go to that table and you look to see which of those um, reactions are uh, compensated for. And again, there is at the, at the bottom of this slide, the website for the, for the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. So let's go to the next slide. I want to thank you for your attention. I know I went through this very quickly. I just wanted to give you a, um, an idea of how the government uh, takes seriously the, uh, uh, any side effects or reactions after vaccination. And I know this is very important to our community because again, of what uh, has transpired in the past and the challenges that our members have when they interact with the healthcare system uh, as it relates to implicit bias. So in order to uh, achieve uh, a better understanding of what should be expected with vaccines, this, this kind of information should be helpful to our community as we prepare for the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hutchins. Uh, we appreciate that um, very informative uh, discussion. We will now move on to our second uh, panelist, um, and it is the distinguished Dr. Oliver Brooks, 
He is the immediate past president of the National Medical Association. He also is chief medical officer at the Watts Healthcare Co uh, Corporation. And he is a member of the work group of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as this is the work group on the COVID-19 vaccine, so very timely. Um, his objectives today, uh, Dr. Brooks is going to review the, the uh, rates of COVID-19 uh, infection in children compared to adults. He's also going to discuss why it is important to be protected from COVID-19 infection. And lastly, he is going to dis discuss the connection, possible connection between influenza, COVID-19, and children. So Dr. Brooks, we're delighted to have you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Woodley Williams, our moderator. Excellent work. I want to thank President McDougal for coordinating our fifth the NMA's fifth CVC PDS professional development series. We will keep this going under his guidance and his leadership. Uh, I have no disclosures regarding my presentation information today. I will note one thing from Dr. Hutchins. She said, she said, get your flu vaccine in September. I'm a little concerned because I got mine three days ago. So I got it a little early. And I have to say, when I went, I went to get my shingles vaccine. They said, we have influenza, oh, we have pneumococcal vaccine. And so I went on and got all of them. And I felt just a, a good feeling. I felt like I just did something simple that protected. I mean, that was, it was a visceral feeling. So I really want people to understand that vaccines are safe and effective, but there is something, some confidence that it gives you. So do get vaccinated. Now, let's look into this. COVID-19 and children. So, and children and getting vaccinated. So right now, why are we looking at children as a separate subset? So let's just look at COVID-19 and children. So this is some data from the AAP and Children's Hospital Association. Uh, the cumulative number of COVID-19 cases in children is about 380,000. This was from about, it says eight, six, but it's a little further back than that, I think the end of July but approximately 9% of all cases, so one in 11 cases we're seeing of COVID-19 are in children. That's a relatively low rate. Uh, 501 cases per 100,000, the population, just so you know, right now the adult case rate in the United States is somewhere around 2,000 per 100,000. So only children get COVID-19 about one quarter the rate of adults. Of note in this information is from July 9th to August 6th, the rate went up 90% in children. So what we're seeing now, children is zero to 17 in terms of age range. The rate in children is going up and that is a concern. So as we go through this discussion today, we can look at why it is of concern that children have COVID-19 and can theoretically, not theoretically, actually spread it. Next. So in terms of testing, children make up between three and 12% of the tests that are done and their positivity is anywhere from 3.7 to 18.6% being positive. In terms of hospitalizations, 0.5 to 5.3% of all reported hospitalizations for children are COVID-19. And between 0.3 and 8.9 of all COVID-19 cases result in hospitalization. That's again, relatively low. The adult rate is somewhere around 12%. So children are hospitalized at a much lower rate. They have less COVID-19, they get hospitalized less. And then look at the last statistic in terms of mortality. Mortality rate of children was anywhere from zero to 0.4% in uh, some data points, zero to 0.5% uh, in other data points. So that's low. Less than 1% of children die. The mortality rate in the U.S. right now from COVID-19 is 3.1%. Children less likely to get it. Children less likely to be hospitalized. Children less likely to die. So why should we even be concerned about COVID-19 in children? Well, let's look at that, okay? 
Well, the vaccine developers had looked at it and had determined uh, right now, the vaccine is not being developed for children. The studies right now on most vaccines are 18 years, say to 99 years to you know, old age. Uh, the way that vaccines generally get developed for children is they are approved to go through the phase three, four studies and uh, get FDA approval as was discussed in the last presentation by Dr. Hutchins. And then they de-escalate, they'll take older children, they will study the vaccine, then look for a dose, cut the dose, then go younger and younger, find the proper dose, and then get FDA approval. So we're not there yet with any of the COVID-19 vaccine. So, and why? Okay, there is this syndrome called multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. This is just now being recognized. I say just now in the last four months or so since COVID-19 has hit, then it has led to these cases that we are seeing in children. So as it's described, the case definition is an individual 21, less than 21 years of age with fever, a laboratory evidence of inflammation, C-reactive protein, and evidence of clinically severe illness requiring hospitalization with multi-system, at least two organ system involvement, cardiac, renal, respiratory, hematologic, GI, dermatologic, neurological, and nothing else that we know causing it. And positive for current or recent uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, by PCR serology or antigens, as some test it says they have or had COVID-19, or suspected or confirmed exposure within the prior four weeks. Now, of interest is these cases of MIS C show up generally approximately five weeks after the children had COVID-19 or were exposed. So it's a later sequelae. Um, there have been, this as of August 13th, there were 570 cases with 1.8% mortality. So this is, a, this is a serious illness. This is data coming out of, um, out of the CDC. So this is one reason why we do care about children getting COVID-19, it is not a benign condition in children. Next slide. Of note, this should be of no surprise to NMA. Hispanic and black patients accounted for the largest proportion of reported MISC patients. I will say, actually, this was somewhat of a surprise to me. I didn't know this, but when I read it, it, it just somehow it just fits. Acute COVID-19 has been reported to disproportionately affect uh, Latinos and Blacks, long-standing inequities in social determinants of health, I've like heard that before with COVID-19, such as housing, economic instability, insurance status, work circumstances of patients and their family members, have systematically placed social, racial, and ethnic minority populations at higher risk of COVID-19 and more severe illness, possibly, not possible including MISC. So this is CDC data that came out in July. So not only is it an issue with children, but it's more of an issue with our African-American children. Next slide. So why else do we care if children get COVID-19? So they can spread it to adults. So now we're talking about opening up the schools and what do we do? How do we manage this? The children need to learn it. I'm a pediatrician. Children need to go to school. Children learn how to socialize with each other. There's a connection with the teacher in the classroom that's face-to-face. -face. Uh, there's exercise, there's activity. There's activity at school. You have a school nurse, some schools, not all schools. But there's data here. As U.S. school officials continue to debate whether to reopen, there's a new study, it's really not that new now, that came out of South Korea that found children aged 10 to 19 can spread the virus just as much as adults. So this was a study done in South Korea, but CDC evaluated their data and decided to publish it itself. So this reported that household transmission of the coronavirus was high for patients 10 to 19 years of age, household transmission rates were low for children zero to nine. So it's the older children, the 10 to 19 <clears throat> year olds, they 
have a further breath distance. Smaller children, even if they cough, the distance is not as great. And to reach this conclusion, researchers analyze reports of 59,000 contacts of 5,706 coronavirus patients in South Korea between January 20th and March 27th. So children definitely can spread it. So even though they don't get hospitalized as readily, even though they don't die as readily, their case rate is lower, they give it to grandma, grandpa, auntie, sister, neighbor. Next slide. So there is no COVID-19 vaccine, period. And when there is one, and there are many in development right now, some in phase three trials, uh, there is the flu vaccine. But the discussion today was vaccines in the black community related to COVID-19, not COVID-19 vaccine. COVID-19 vaccine is a very important discussion. Right now, we're looking at all of them. So there is an influenza vaccine, okay? So this shows the rates of, of vaccination, children on the left side, adults on the right side. So what we see, the black line is the dark line, if you will, is the one I will say to follow. That's the overall rate of vaccination uh, for children from six months to 17 years of age. So you see the rate anywhere from 54 to 60% from years 2010-11 to last year's season. The yeah, overall adult rate, 18 and older, is lower. So we do know that influenza is primarily a respiratory condition, respiratory infection. We do know that COVID-19 is a respiratory condition, a respiratory infection. Of course, 20% of cases affect heart also. There's a lot of cardiac involvement with COVID-19. So since there is no vaccine for children or adults right now, our focus is to get our population vaccinated. African Americans die at a higher rate from influenza. We tend to have a mistrust, as was stated by the last presenter, of vaccines, influenza vaccine in particular. So right now there is no vaccine for COVID-19, there's influenza. So we really right now have a primary focus, as I stated, on influenza vaccine. One other thing I will say before I get to my clothes is that there was a study done in Hong Kong that showed that people that got influenza vaccine had a protective effect from dying within six months of heart disease or MI, heart attack, stroke, cancer, and kidney disease. Think about that. Influenza is a respiratory condition, but if you get influenza, you're more likely to die from these other conditions that are not even respiratory conditions. So just another reason to get an influenza vaccine. If you get influenza and COVID-19, your chances of having an adverse outcome grow exponentially. Next slide. So this is that data. I just, I'm happy that it's here. So you see, impact on mortality. So this is risk reduction by getting influenza, 65% reduction, stroke, 60 for renal disease, diabetes, COPD, uh, heart disease. So you get your influenza vaccine for many reasons, okay? I'm talking about children. Children get vaccinated, they don't spread it to adults. Adults get the vaccine, they're less likely to die from these particular conditions. Next slide. So another reason it's very important to focus on vaccines and have us as a community focus. When people were asked, what's the best thing to stop COVID-19 from spreading? This was a data that was uh, presented uh, from, uh, this is out of the University of Chicago, right? They, they did a study, their research center. So people said um, quarantining, wearing a mask, keeping social distance. They put a vaccine forth. A lot of our minds, public health, physicians, scientists, we really put vaccines at the top. Not until there's effective vaccine, we'll really have true protection. That is not what the public is focused on. So it is up to us to ensure the public understands clearly the value of vaccinating. Next slide. So in summary, okay, I, I pulled this quote from a uh, woman, Carol 
a Cal assistant professor of AIDS ID at Emory. While the role of children in the chain of transmission of SARS-CoV-2 remains to be fully defined, although it is clearly defined in terms of spread, they likely play an important role based on our knowledge of us other respiratory viruses. As a result, she argued that to achieve herd immunity, COVID-19 vaccine trials should include children. I will also add that I showed you that MISC disproportionately affects Blacks and Latinos, just like COVID-19 does. So I'll close. Sooner or later, a COVID-19 vaccine for children will need to be made available and made available for all children. That is how we will get our arms around this condition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooks, um, for that um, elegant presentation um, and full of uh, information that's very useful to um, too many. Um, we're going to, uh, final panelist is Dr. Dial Hewlett, uh, Jr. Um, he is presently the Director of Disease Control and um, Deputy to the Commissioner um, in the D Department of Health, Westchester County, New York. Um, I'm going to hope we'll have some time for questions, but I asked Dr. I. Hewlett if you would um, begin your discussion. He will be talking about um, the various therapies um, in terms of what we know for COVID-19 uh, treatment. Dr. Hewlett. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Whitley Williams, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers uh, from the NMA who have uh, invited me to give this talk. And also, I'm honored uh, to be involved in a program which is being done in collaboration with the Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, with regard to disclosures, I have no disclosures uh, specifically regarding uh, the uh, the topic of interferons. However, I need to disclose the fact that I'm a retired um, member of the pharmaceutical community and I retired from Pfizer Pharmaceuticals one year ago. I was asked to talk about interferons and the potential use in the treatment and prevention of COVID. This is a little bit different than some of the talks that you've heard already. Uh, I think that this came up because there may be a role for the use of interferons in the prevention of COVID. We can go to the next slide, please. So the interferons, the National Institutes of Health, NIH, uh, the treatment guidelines panel actually recommended against the use of interferons for the treatment of patients with severe and critical COVID-19, except in the setting of clinical trials. Uh, now, one of the things that has already been mentioned, and we'll mention this here again to right now, is that control clinical trials are necessary in order to accurately predict the efficacy or effectiveness and the safety of a medication or an intervention in patients. And of course, this includes vaccines. The US National, National Library of Medicine and the NIH maintain a website which lists all registered clinical trials. And I think that this is useful. A lot of people don't know about this, but you can go to the website, www.clinicaltrials.gov. And there's a listing of clinical trials across all of the different therapeutic areas in medicine. And you can find uh, all of the vaccine uh, information there, as well as information about other uh, clinical uh, therapeutic modalities. Currently, there are 23 registered clinical trials listed on the site, which include alpha interferon, uh, which are being conducted. And they're being conducted using three different formulations. There is interferon in the formulation of a nasal drop, a nebulized formulation, and an injectable formulation. There are three different areas in which these clinical trials are being conducted. One is for what we call adjunctive therapy, and nine of the 23 are in that category. Prevention, three of the 23 are in that area, and there is some overlap. Uh, and immunologic response, uh, which is where the study is being done not to look at uh, treatment, but looking at the immunologic response in individuals. That's 11 of those, uh, of those 23 studies. Next, next slide, please. So as far as the background, this is a very interesting uh, compound. The interferons were discovered back in 1957. Uh, Professor Isaacs and Pro Professor Lindenman of the National Institutes of Medical Research in London actually discovered this. The compound was named for its ability to interfere 
with viral proliferation or viral growth. And various forms of interferons are actually our body's most rapidly produced and important defenses against viruses. Viruses in general, and of course, this applies to uh, coronavirus as well. Interferons also suppress the growth of cancer cells in laboratory animals. And this is one of the reasons why you have probably read about or heard about interferons being used in the treatment of some of our patients with various forms of cancer. Now, interferons are produced by all vertebrate animals, and interferons belong to a family of compounds known as the cytokines. And these cytokines with antiviral properties have been suggested as a potential treatment for COVID-19 because of their in vitro and in vivo antiviral properties. And so interferon has been uh, suggested for this, uh, for this use and it does belong to the family of cytokines. So think about this as we go through the next slide. So in terms of determining the role for interferons in COVID-19, this is a very complex question. Uh, and in order to uh, come to a conclusion, our conclusions are going to have to be guided by the results of clinical trials. So in severe cases of COVID-19, a person's immune system tends to throw everything it has at the coronavirus, but some of the weapons it lobs end up in, in terms of hurt, end up hurting the patient instead of actually fighting the virus. And this is known as the cytokine storm. And this is a quotation uh, from uh, Dr. Hessman that just was published last week in uh, Science News. In COVID-19, there may be suppression initially of the production of interferon. And this is likely detrimental. So it seems to be a very clever virus in that it is actually turning off the body's defense mechanism that would essentially suppress the virus. So bolstering the body's first line of defense against the virus using drugs known as interferons may help prevent severe illness. The problem I think here, and the thing that's very, very important, is that timing of the intervention is essential. The question I think is, is there a role for interferons in patients with mild to moderate illness? There may well be. We know that with many of the other interventions that are out there, that it is better and more advantageous for the patient if we intervene earlier rather than waiting until a person is critically ill. Is there a role for interferon in the prevention of COVID-19 infection? There, is, there are trials that are ongoing right now looking at whether injectable interferon given to people who don't have the infection will actually prevent them from getting the infection. And we don't have the answers to these questions. And so I think in closing my talk, I will basically say that we cannot overemphasize the importance of clinical trials. Our decisions about recommendations must be guided by the results of clinical trials. And certainly we have to wait for more answers before we can actually recommend uh, for or against the use of uh, interferon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hewlett, uh, for that um, uh, presentation full of information. We appreciate your discussion um, of the therapies. Um, and I'd like to thank all our panelists. We have about five minutes for questions. Um, and I would like to pose, and I'll start with Dr. Hewlett first, um, you have told us that alpha interferon prevents viruses like the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 virus from replicating. Um, why do we need more studies? And wouldn't it make sense to offer interferons to all patients um, who have COVID-19 as a part of a treatment cocktail? Um, thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Whitley Williams. One of the problems I think that we face in our patients with COVID is the development of what we call the cytokine storm, where we have all of these different cytokines that are acting and uh, sometimes to the detriment of the patient. And so if we give the patient interferon, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine, it may actually cause more inflammation, which might actually make the person worse. 
And if, however, we give the, the uh, interferon earlier, then potentially there's going to be an advantage. And so I think that's why we need to have the studies done carefully so that we can determine if there's a role for the interferon and if there is a role, at what point in the course of the disease is it most likely to help the patient. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hewlett. Um, Dr. Brooks, I have a question for you. Um, what actions have occurred that have allowed COVID-19 vaccine to be developed and actually in a phase three trial already in such a short time. I think this might raise some anxiety and questions um, in, the, in our community, in our African-American community. Um, can we really um, uh, believe that this is going to be a good and safe vaccine? I believe that we can believe that it can be a good and safe vaccine. I will be watching the development of any of the vaccines that are uh, coming to market soon, if they do come to market. One quick statement, I had no disclosures during this presentation, but Dr. Hewlett, Joglo, I should probably say this, I have been on the Speaker's Bureau for Santa Fe Pastor. No relationship to this talk. Uh, as it relates to that, so what is happening now, and Dr. Hutchins gave a good presentation, phase one, two, and three, what they're doing is they're overlapping. Generally speaking, the vaccine will do phase one, do well, which is dosing and safety, phase two, safety and efficacy, and then phase three, whether it really works. So they're doing all of these kind of layered one on top of the other. So it's, it's okay to do that, but it's generally not the way things are done. Number two is they're manufacturing the vaccine before it gets approval. Now, most of the time you wouldn't do that because suppose it doesn't get approval and you've wasted all that money. The government has put the money to the pharmaceuticals to say, we'll pay you to start making it now. If you have to throw it all away, well, you didn't lose any money. So part of what they're doing, this Operation Warp Speed and evaluating and developing the vaccines is just being done because I, basically they're being funded to do it because there is such a need. I mean, this is the first pandemic we've had in 102 years like this. So desperate times call for serious measures. Uh, I do believe that the vaccine will be, if approved by the FDA, uh, safe and effective. There are many thousands that will be in the phase three trials. Thank you so much for your response. And the last question I have for Dr. Hutchins, um, how can physicians um, work together with communities to dispel some of the myths about vaccinations, um, particularly influenza vaccination, as well as um, COVID-19 when that vaccine does become available. Um, there are segments in our population that do have tremendous distrust, particularly when the vaccine might be dispensed by the federal government. Thank you for, for that question, Dr. Whitley Williams. Uh, I like what Dr. Oliver Brooks said early on, that he received his influenza vaccine. So when healthcare providers who are trusted by their patients indicate the benefits of vaccination and, and say that they've benefited by vaccinations, uh, the influenza vaccine in particular, and so have their family members, then you're more likely to trust uh, getting the vaccine. But I think that it's also important that we continue to remind our, our patients about how vaccines are developed, licensed, and then the post-marketing or post-licensure uh, monitoring of vaccines, and also for, uh, about the injury compensation program. Uh, we have to remind that there wouldn't be an injury compensation program if there were a lot of side effects, right? That would bankroll, you know, bankrupt the, the federal government. But because there are, um, there are some side effects that are extremely rare, it is good to have a, a vaccine injury compensation program. And our patients need to know about that as well. So I think that once we you know, share the information that we are confident uh, and our family members are confident in getting vaccinate, vaccinated and that the, the government is very serious about protecting vaccine safety to the point that there is an injury compensation program that they 
may may also feel more confident in getting vaccinated. Thank you so much for your response, uh, Dr. Hutchins. Um, Dr. Brooks, the next question is for you. Um, I know you have experience in working with community uh, coalitions regarding um, immunizations. Um, do you have any advice um, or suggestions or recommendations for other physicians, healthcare providers like yourself who have worked with communities of color in informing um, these, uh, informing people about uh, vaccinations, their benefits, and um, how they, the safety of them, how they're monitored, et cetera, has, as has already been discussed. Yes, and do understand the vaccine hesitancy, vaccine refusal, generally is an emotional response. So my approach is to have the facts, but find out what it is that is allowing someone to have this degree. The other thing in terms of overall messaging, go to the community, speak our language, find those that speak to the community, uh, barbers, the, uh, the ministry, uh, celebrities, radio, people on radio. So we did a quick, very quick, we did a project where we just asked people in the um, adult uh, a centers to say they, they got vaccinated because they didn't want to get influenza because they wanted to be around the, the grandchildren. We put posters up around the neighborhood. We found our, our influenza rates went up. So go directly to the community, speak the message, and be clear. You just said, I got my flu vaccine shot. You should get yours. Thank you so much um, for responding to that. And I understand the National Medical Association may also be involved with developing some materials toolkits that might be able to be used or definitely will be able to be used in the um, African American community. Uh, so um, we continue to congratulate the NMA on leading the way and trying to inform uh, persons um, in communities of color. Uh, because it's so important that we protect, um, we protect ourselves from influenza and from COVID-19 when that becomes available. Um, I wanted to, um, any, any of the panelists can answer this question, it may be the last one, but African-American patients and families often are very skeptical about clinical trials. And we know that there's an underrepresentation of um, persons of color, particularly African Americans in the current COVID-19 trials. Have you encouraged patients from your practice um, or your family or friends to enroll in clinical trials? And, and um, you know, what pitch can we make to the community? Because we really do want to be represented proportionately. Um, and I'm going to have to wrap up after this. So if we can have a brief answer, but any of the panelists, thank you. I have, Dr. Whitley Williams, I've encouraged patients uh, when I had a full-time practice to enroll in clinical trials, and I've encouraged family members. Uh, some of my family members over the years have had various forms of cancer, and I've uh, encouraged them to enroll in trials. And uh, one other thing, which is not part of the question, but I do want to put a plug in for uh, our pregnant women, uh, they should actually receive the influenza vaccine. And typically, we try to avoid things uh, like vaccines in people during pregnancy, but we know that there's a higher rate of, uh, of uh, serious illness uh, among our pregnant patients. And I'll just say to, for another plug that I encourage my two daughters and my daughter-in-law to all have the flu vaccine and they all had healthy children. Terrific, thank you. We, we know by immunizing pregnant women that it does offer protection to their newborn babies. That has been demonstrated like to take this opportunity to thank our uh, panelists, Dr. Brooks, Dr. Hewlett, and Dr. Hutchins for these wonderful presentations. It's a wealth of information, overwhelming, but so important that we get this information out. I also would like to, um, as our panelists have stated, to thank the uh, National Medical Association and Dr. McDougall for your leadership for organizing this session and also to thank the Con Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. So I'm going to turn it back to Dr. McDougall. Thank you all. I'll be brief. This was uh, a wonderful uh, panel. And uh, so 
we're going to work on increasing that percentage of only 20% of African Americans being willing to receive and participate in COVID-19 vaccination. That's very important. And uh, this was uh, fantastic. I want to thank Dr. Whitley Williams, uh, Dr. Hutchins, Dr. Brooks, and Dr. Uh, Hewlett for uh, speaking truth to our community. And look forward to our next session, Professional Development Series with Congressional Black Caucus. Uh, the title, Social Determinants of and the Criminal Justice Reform and Abolishing Capital Punishment to be aired on September 9th at a.m. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.